I love this because this is, when I used to teach, you go to class and wait, you don't have to say anything and all of a sudden it's silent. That means everybody is ready. Uh, delighted to have you all here this evening at the University of Waterloo. I see that nobody really paid any attention to that little white stuff. I don't know what it is. I can't remember, but uh, uh, you're all here. Um, it's fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, before we start uh, this evening, it's very important uh, to um, uh, acknowledge and pay respect to the elders, past and present, to the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. As many of you will know, we are gathered to this evening on their traditional territory as the University of Waterloo sits on the Haldeman Track, the land promised to the Six Nations people along the Grand River. Our institution is enriched by having open, free conversations, and this evening we are going to taste one of those. Um, it is very important for us to di diversify our, our learnings, our views on various topics. And I'm really, really delighted that um, this evening I was made possible by very, very generous and philanthropic investment by TD in the TD Walter Bean Visiting Professorship in the Faculty of Environment. It used to be a traveling visiting professorship and uh, the Faculty of Environment said, no, we want to have the whole thing. And uh, since then, they have taken over that visiting uh, professorship. That's wonderful. Um, TD's investment at Waterloo continued to bring together cross-sectional partners and stakeholders from around the globe um, uh, towards dialogue, uh, dialogue progress, and, uh, uh, and making the world a better and, more importantly, more inclusive place. It's also important for us all to remember that this is a very important year for our Faculty of Environment. In case you didn't know, it's celebrating its 50th anniversary. Great anniversary. If you, if, you, if you just turn your head and look back, in the past 50 years, the Faculty of Environment has done some enormous things. We are very proud and grateful for their accomplishments. But what's also more important and exciting that we are looking the uh, next 50 years of tremendous interdisciplinary teaching and research and scholarship they are going to bring to the world that is so so much hungry and thirsty for the contributions that this faculty will make. And their contributions will go well beyond the borders of our country. It will, they, are, they will be globally important. Um, if you are really curious about this young, very young faculty and what it's been able to accomplish, uh, it's home to uh, the Intech Center for Climate Adaptation. And in addition to actually being the largest faculty of environment in Canada. Um, and uh, they are a big part of, for example, a very, very important global research institute under uh, uh, the banner of Water Institute. Uh, so our faculty of environment has taken a very important global leadership role. And I congratulate first uh, Dean uh, uh, Jean, <laughs> as that's how we uh, uh, call her, but uh, uh, Dr. Jean Henry and her colleagues really working tirelessly and passionately make sure that our world is a better and more sustainable world. And also to, through her very uh, tireless efforts, we brought the leadership position to a sustainable development goals um, uh, 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 under uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network to Canada. Among all these institutions, the University of Waterloo took the leadership position, and thanks to that leadership position, we are seeing many, many more organizations in Canada around the world coming around the sustainability goals and how we can deliver them through networking. What's also more important for us while we are celebrating our successes and acknowledging contributions of many, we are investing in a future. And we, that investment is 
of course, in the form of our scholarship, knowledge creation, but more importantly, uh, investing in our brilliant young minds and our students, young scholars. And this is the reason why I'm so delighted that we are, we are, we are, we are hosting a remarkable speaker this evening. Uh, I am uh, I'm, I'm really uh, very much impressed by our, because she will be introduced by somebody else. I'm not going to disclose many things, but it is tremendously uh, uh, rewarding just to go through your accomplishments and what it is that we are just about to hear. To do this, I would like to invite uh, Matthew Croft. He is the uh, branch manager at TD, and he, has, uh, he will bring uh, some... Uh, greetings and remarks uh, on behalf of TD. But when you go back, please also bring our, our gratitude and our well wishes to TD and ask them to keep doing this and grow it, by the way. So, uh, and then Matthew will be followed by uh, 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 faculty, uh, the Dean uh, Jean Andre, who will properly introduce our speaker. So again, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Okay, so good evening, everyone. On behalf of my colleagues at TD, I'm thrilled to be here today at the TD Walter Bean Professorship Public Lecture. TD recognizes the importance of education and the environment, and in 2003, TD established the Graduate Scholarships in the Environment with an Endowment to the University of Waterloo, as we were talking about. So, and in 2011, we created the TD Graduate Bursaries in the Environment. Needless to say, our interests reflect that of our community, and we are pleased to be here tonight. At TD, our purpose is to enrich the lives, lives of our customers, colleagues, and communities. And this is why we created the Ready Commitment, our new corporate citizenship platform aimed at opening doors to a more inclusive and sustainable tomorrow for everyone. And it's partnerships like this with the University of Waterloo that allow us to deliver on this commitment. At TD, we are dedicated to creating the conditions where we all have the opportunity to do our part and succeed with confidence in a changing world. Supporting the transition to a low carbon economy with a $100 billion target in low carbon lending, financing, asset management, and other programs by 2030. On behalf of my TD colleagues here tonight and more than 400 TD employees in Waterloo Region, we say thank you to the University of Waterloo for your continued environmental and educational leadership in the world. I hope everyone enjoys the lecture and thank you again. Well, hello everyone. It's fantastic to see the, the room so full again. Uh, we've been trying very hard whenever we host this to get the word out to the community and it's always heartwarming to see so many if you come out, especially on a cold night like tonight. Thank you, Matt, for uh, your remarks and my, send my own personal thank you, please, to your colleagues at TD. We really do appreciate your presence and also the support. Now, the, I, I'm going to tell you a little about the TD Walter Bean Professorship just briefly and then I'll, of course, introduce our speaker. But this, the, the, the TD Walter Bean Visiting Professorship was founded in 1992 by the late Walter Bean, who was the president of Waterloo Trust until its merger with Canada Trust in 1968. And for many of you from Southern Ontario, you will know that it was TD who then purchased um, Canada Trust in, in the year 2000. Walter Bean was not only a businessman, but also a community leader. And he believed that in contributing to the welfare of area residents. And some of you who I know are outdoors people, in fact, I recognize some of you who are, you'll recognize um, Walter Bean as the name of one of the great trails that we have along the Grand River. Um, so, so t funded by this long-standing endowment, the T.D. Walter Bean Professorship promotes a legacy of community investment and commitment to education, to youth, and to public. It has really become a signature event here at the university, and to date we've welcomed 23 world-renowned experts to share their expertise. And they inspire us, and they help us engage in issues that we know matter both for our local community, but also as global citizens. So today it's my honor to welcome you, Dr. Jacqueline McGlade, someone who I've spent much time with over the last week, and I've come to so enjoy and be so inspired. We were born in the same year, but that's where our similarities ended, because Jacqueline is much braver and much smarter, and has been able to network in a world that is just incredible what she's done, and she's going to share a bit with you uh, today. So we're really honored, Jacqueline, that you would come and, and spend this, uh, this uh, time with us. Now, let me tell you just a little about her. 
Dr. Jackie McGlade is a marine biologist by training. She's a global leader in biodiversity, in ecosystems, and in climate change. She was the chief scientist and director of the science division of the United Nations Environment Program between 2014 and 2017, and she was the executive director of the European Environment Agency before that from 2003. She's currently juggling three different professional roles. She is the Frank Johnson Professor of the Environment at Gresham College in London. She is Professor of Public Policy and Governance at Strathmore University Business School in Nairobi, Kenya. And she is Professor of Sustainable Development and Resilience at the Institute for Global Prosperity at University College London. Tonight, Jackie will be talking about the topic together building sustainable communities. Please join me in welcoming her. Okay, so again, thank you to our, I should say to our sponsor, thank you very much. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure to come back to Canada because for some of you who know me, um, I came to Canada when I was very young. I came to do my PhD and after my PhD, not only did I have children, but I also joined the federal government and I worked on the boundary dispute between Canada and the USA. And for the life of me, I became a, a Canadian citizen, which was absolutely brilliant. So I spent many years here um, doing research out at sea and so on and so forth. But it was like a baptism of fire because, you know, age 26, I found myself in the world court representing a country that I was literally just, I had just entered. It was very, very daunting. Um, I would love to use this opportunity to say what we were never allowed to say in 1985, which was, we won. <laughs> we won. <laughs> and in a way, it was, um, it was something which is going to feed into this talk because we were a very small team. It was a very typical kind of Canadian approach. Who would ever take on the USA? We had Ronald Reagan on that side of the border. We had Brian Mulroney on this side. And there was the log, there was the forestry, logging industry. Everyone was, it was just not a good time. And then we suddenly find ourselves in the court. We had a team of four. They had a team of 73. <laughs> they had lawyers like you cannot imagine. But we had Len Legault, and I don't know if you know anything about him, but he's quite a man. You know, he was essentially a head of the judiciary. But we went off to, um, uh, we went off to Ottawa. We were given our instructions. And the most important instruction was, maintain your integrity. Um, Try to tell the best story you can, and don't forget that when it really comes down to it, just switch to French. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. You can't imagine it. So you're in the court, and the other side are grilling, and then um, you know, they're trying to sort of undermine you, but it's not going very well. And then uh, Len Legault comes up onto the stand and they have some of their best scientists from the USA on the stand. Um, and it's, it went so something like this. Well, Dr. XXX, I won't say who it was. You said in 1966 that there was only one ecosystem in the Gulf of Maine and in the Bay of Fundy. But then in 1972, you seem to say that there were three. Now, which one is it? Is it one or is it three? To which, of course, he says, but this is science. It's uncertain. We keep discovering new things. No, 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 no. Are you certain or are you not certain? And then he switched into French. Perfect. <laughs> at, which point, at which point, I think we won the course. But it, just, it was just a, a wonderful example of what we were trying to do was put the story of communities. Because in the end, that's what the judges really made their decision on. They came. They went out in a boat. They came through the Gulf, they went down through the Bay of Fundy, and what did the Americans show? They showed Cape Cod, very, very fancy houses, beautiful boats, and what we showed was Yarmouth. What we showed was the real communities who were completely dependent on this fishery for their survival. And that really made a difference. That was the point, that they saw communities that they felt really genuinely justified having resources to take care of and to take them into the future. Anyway, that's a long story, but it's really to say that the theme of my talk tonight is about building and sustaining communities. So what is it 
about communities that sometimes seem to be at the very, very end of the line. You know, they're the last ones to receive federal support. They're the last ones to get the latest school. They're the last ones to get whatever it is. And yet somehow those are the communities that really can say in the long run that they have resilience and that they withstand all these kinds of changes. So I will quickly introduce myself in a slightly different form, because I have all those things at the bottom. But the one in the middle is the one I'm going to talk about today, which is the Oangan village. Um, so you, some of you will have noticed that I wear these bands. These are my marriage bands, because I'm actually married to a, one of the Maasai chiefs. Uh, so I'm a full-on uh, member of the Maasai tribe. I might not look like it, but as far as they're concerned, I am. They're completely colorblind, so, which is a wonderful thing. They really are. Uh, so when I talk about communities, I really want to kind of introduce you at the beginning of where I live, because it will really affect what I'm going to say to you tonight. But also, it's fundamentally changed and made me realize quite how serious we have to be in our endeavors when we talk about communities, but more importantly, when we look for solutions to take us out into the future. So let me take you to my world, or part of my world. Um, I'm pretty sure that many of you will have heard of the Maasai Mara. I don't know, how many, have any of you ever visited the Maasai Mara? I'm kind of curious. Yes, some? Very good. For those of you who haven't, I'm sure you've seen it on television. Discovery Channel often has a story about the wildebeest crossing the river and the crocodiles waiting and the hippos waiting, and it's a, a massive spectacle. In some ways, it's called the eighth wonder of the world, and it really is a spectacular place, and that's where I live. So for those of you who aren't quite sure where it is, it's in Kenya, East Africa. The Maasai Mara Reserve is right on the border with Tanzania. And these are my neighbors. This is who I live with every day. So I'm surrounded by many, many, many animals, some of which are dangerous, um, all of them fascinating, and it's a, it's a paradise for someone who actually loves uh, nature and loves to work close to it. So this is my community. This is my village, and I would like to introduce them to you. Um, there's a lot to be said about the Maasai, and I won't use this lecture to do that. But what I have found since I've been living with them, and have become a Maasai, and I obviously have to speak Maasai because they don't, on the whole, speak any other language. Some, a few of them can speak a little English and some Swahili, but mostly everything is spoken in Ki Maasai, in Maasai, which is not a written language, it's a, it's a tonal, um, oral language. So it's a culture which, as many of you know, is iconic. It's a semi-nomadic pastoralist culture, which means that you get up, get up and go every five to 10 years and you move. Livestock is absolutely essential. And the whole worldview is around um, essentially a great God who, at some time in the past, handed down the cattle to the Maasai, which is why whenever a Maasai arrives anywhere in the world and they see cows, they say, oh, those are my cows because they are completely convinced that every cow on earth belongs to the Maasai tribe, okay? So be careful if you're a farmer and you invite a Maasai warrior to your home, okay? Very, very important. But it's not that they're gonna do anything to the cows, they're just going to worry about them probably, so they'll, they'll, uh, they'll have a personal interest in making sure they're okay. Um, so there is a whole life history which in the end creates a community. So even though it's a tribe of nearly 670 thousand people. It's made up of, and, and that is considered the community, it has designations. So we have clans, we have groupings, we have year, age classes that merge into one, and so on and so forth. So if you walk along the road and you meet an elder, the elder will come in front of you, especially if you're someone who is slightly older, but, but it, if you're young, I mean, forget it, because you need to be able to tell the elder who you are. Not your name only, but who is your family, who are you related to, and where do you come from? And then the elder will withdraw, and might even sit on the side of the road for two or three hours, and just be thinking about, <laughs> and it's all in their heads. And then at the moment when he realizes, or she realizes who you are, will then come to you and actually give you the proper greeting. Because it's a very formal way in which people greet. Now, why is that important? Well, it's essential because if you have a community where you're not writing things down, there's very, very little written material, you have to retain everything in your head about who is who. 
not only because of who can marry who and who can't, but also just the whole generational levels of respect. And this is the great thing about the Maasai. They have enormous respect for each other. So the two-year-olds actually do respect the four-year-olds because the four-year-olds get a stick. And the, fo the four-year-olds respect the six-year-olds because the stick can then be used to move the sheep along. And the six-year-olds respect the nine-year-olds because then they get goats. And then the nine-year-olds respect the 10-year-olds and 11 and 12 because they then get the cows. And then everybody respects the 15-year-olds because those are the boys particularly, but also the girls who then go through to the next stages of their lives and out into the bush. So what you see at the top is two little boys. One of them was my husband on the left-hand side with his brother before when they were about 14, and they went off into the bush for six years. So they basically walk around for six years in and out and around the Rift Valley, living off the land, protecting themselves together. They go out in an age class of about 100, and they literally are out there. So in that time, they do have a lot of fights, all the time. They figure out who's the bravest. They also assign to somebody the task of carrying the woes of the tribe for the rest of their life, which I find a fascinating, absolutely fascinating thing. And they watch each other to the point where they understand who could take that responsibility. And then there are other designated roles. So that when they come back, they're allowed to get married. But before they actually do get married, they become part of what are called the junior elders. And those are the people who you see jumping. So if you go online and you look on YouTube and you write uh, Maasai warrior dancing, you'll probably come to my village and you'll see the guys dancing. So what they do is they dance, and this is in preparation for attracting your wife. Um, when, when visitors come, they do it, but, but it, it's a deadly serious thing. And I notice the young ladies do look very carefully at these men jumping. Um, to the right-hand side are the elders. And the elders, when I arrived, were um, quite an extraordinary group of people. They're usually in their 90s and 100s. We've, I'm pretty sure we've got two people who are at least 105, 106. Um, Nobody wears glasses. I am the only person in the whole tribe that appears to wear glasses. So, you know, they have perfect eyesight. They can see a long way. Of course, they don't have to read, so that's one thing. But nevertheless, they're in pretty good health. No diabetes, very little case, few cases of cancer. Um, generally, you know, all up, fit and healthy. So quite amazing. Easily walk, you know, 50 kilometers in a day. So there are no slouches when it comes to this. We have cows, of course. And this is us when we got married. When I got married, we had to build a new village. So here we are building the village, carrying a new house, uh, carrying a new, carrying the old roof from the old village to the new house. Um, this is the grass that goes on the house, and so on. What I did, of course, was try to, you know, ameliorate some of the not such great things. So put in um, energy. So I put lights into every house. So these are all mud huts but they have a house, they, they have lights, every room has a light, and I put water in. So I brought water from the mountains, um, and you know, essentially, with toilets, water, and electricity, life is perfect. It's quite extraordinary. And we don't have fires in the house anymore. So we have little Gcos, so there's no smoke, so essentially all of that is gone. So I can thoroughly recommend it to you. If you ever want to come and visit, please do. Um, but, the, but the wonderful thing about it is that having kind of figured out some of those problems, actually, uh, you have a population that is probably one of the healthiest populations that you can come across. What is the diet? The diet is very, very minimal. It's like a cup of milk made into tea in the morning, that's like tea, nicely frothy, uh, and then a few herbs, and then get to the end of the day, you have another cup of milk, and then you go to bed. Okay, so it's not a lot of food, uh, with meat maybe twice a month. So it's, it's sparse rations, but in fact, you don't really notice it. So you'll have a man who may be about two meters tall, and he'll only weigh about 46 kilos. But they are incredibly tough. So I'll just leave that with you. So now, what is, it, what is the hallmark of the community? What is the community? A community is made up of, as in many tribes, a sense of who does what. People have roles. Men and women have different roles. Men protect. Women do a lot of the kind of what looks like very heavy work, but essentially are building the community. Every child belongs to the community. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. So there are no such things as orphans. Um, so children can approach every adult and expect to be essentially welcomed. There's no, there's no sense in which you can't go into someone else's house. 
Um, my job is to make sure everyone's alive every morning. And what's fascinating is that when you wake in the morning, the first thing I do and have to greet everybody is say, make some greetings, iragasupad, kirasupadpi, and then it's like, yes, I survived, nobody ate me, no hyenas got me, and I'm actually here today, and it's another day, great, let's have a cup of tea. And then you get through the day, and there might be a few little kind of perturbations, people might decide to have an argument, but you have to sort all your arguments out before you go to bed. So you get a black stick from my husband, if it's very serious, put it on the ground, both parties can discuss and say what's wrong. They're encouraged by the community. Eh, eh, eh. So everyone encourages them to say what's the problem. And then the matter is resolved. And then you dump it. You just put the past out of your minds. You don't carry any of that forward. So that when you go to bed, in Kawari Sidai, it means sleep well, survive, and thrive. So everyone goes to sleep, usually quite early, very happy, and then you wake up again the next day, and it's just repeated all over again. There's no future as such. They don't have words for the future. They have a word for the day after tomorrow, but that's it. There's no, there's no phrases for next week. So when I go away, they say, when are you back? Next week, I used to say. What is that? Well, it's the day after the day after the day after the day after tomorrow. You know. But then if I didn't come back in two or three days, they would think that I died. So they're like, are you ever coming back? Yes. So now they know that when I travel. So in a sense, the community is both the physicality, it's the virtual community, it's this sense of you're there and you're connected, but it's also a way in which people interact with each other all through the day and every day. So you can go away for a long time and come back, and it, is as, it literally is as if you've just been there. Um, so it's partly linguistic, but it's also this sense that you were never out of our minds. You may not have been in the village, but we knew what you were doing. And we have people telling us all the time what you're doing. So it's always coming back. But they're, they're tremendously forgiving. So if you do something really bad, you have to be, you know, you're asked, please forgive them, please forgive them. So people are forgiven all through their lives, even if they're slightly naughty. Uh, so what's the kind of uh, life that we live in? Well, we're surrounded and live next to the most... Um, investment intensive and probably um, profitable industry in the, in, the, in the tourism business, which is the safari. Um, we have more than 260 lodges in the park, but none of that money comes into the community. And this is the really sad part about it. So the people where I live have no money, I mean literally no money, and over the, over the fence are some of the richest people in the world who fly in and come for visits and so on. So this has set me thinking, what is it that enables an industry that sells itself on we support the community when the reality is absolutely not that? Where essentially all of those monies are not coming there, but they're either given into the national and then they're supposed to trickle down, or they're actually just offshored into another country altogether. It depends where the company comes from. So there are very, very few lodges where they hire local people and where the funds actually go directly to the, to the, to the um, community itself. And so I'm very challenging. I actually ask a lot of them, well, you know, so what are you, what are you selling here? You know, you're selling a luxury hotel next to all these beautiful animals, but who do you think kept all these animals alive? It's the community. And these animals belong to the community and you're on community land. This is why I love the fact that when you start here, you, you, you actually give thanks to the elders for being on land that belongs to the community. So we haven't quite got to that level of sophistication, but I'm thinking about this now, that when we start our meetings, I think we should actually adopt a very similar thing because people are unaware that most of Africa still belongs to communities. They just haven't claimed it. You know, we're, we're in the sort of capitalist, the capitalist regime. They also bring a lot of trouble because well, lodges are profligate in the sense of waste and environmental damage and so on. So I ended up having to build an incinerator and a waste management system. It's ridiculous. But I did it because the day that I arrived was in the midst of a dreadful drought. And the picture on the top is literally where I live. 4,000 cattle were dying over, say, three or four weeks. But when we opened up the cows, we discovered that inside there were plastic bags. They literally were dying because of eating plastic. 
I mean, the drought was very bad, but if it hadn't been for the plastic, many of those cattle would have survived. Where does it come from? Well, it sort of blows down the Rift Valley and so on. Now, this was before the plastics ban, but essentially, um, and, and we see a huge difference because of that. But it's amazing how people who go away on ecotourism and so on, they love the idea that they're coming to see communities and tribes and so on, but they somehow forget that we totally depend on the natural world for survival. And it's really like someone coming onto your front lawn and just, just dumping their trash on your front lawn. But because it doesn't seem to own, it's not owned by anybody, it seems perfectly okay, you know, to chuck your plastic bottle out of the window and so on and so forth. The thing about living where I live now is that you're really on the edge. And, and so more and more, when people are working in international development, and they come with technology fixes, and they come with this and that. What's not clear to many is that the daily grind of survival is only possible because of a community. You cannot survive in this environment on your own. And in fact, it's the worst thing that can happen to you that if you do cross the line too many times, um, you can be asked to leave the village. And you are essentially expelled at night and your chances of survival on your own are pretty, pretty slim. So they knowingly will do that if someone actually goes far too far. So it's a really dangerous place, to be quite honest. And so what keeps everybody alive and surviving and thriving is the fact that at any time you can reach out and there is an entire community there for you. So it's a reciprocity arrangement. You, you're expected to participate and to give when you have on the basis that when you need people, they'll be there for you. But we don't have, in a way, any insurance. So for example, here on the bottom, you see some maize. And because of climate change, so we have droughts, absolutely, but we also have intensive rains and floods. And we have no facilities to support and hold um, the produce once it's been harvested. And what we have now is profit. We have absolutely pervasive aflatoxin because of the way in which we store and, and you know, basically take to market products such as this. Now, the Maasai don't farm. They don't believe in damaging the earth, so they don't want to put holes in the earth. So there is no crop growing. That's why they have livestock. Some people will grow crops on Maasai land, but it will never be a Maasai who will be doing it. Nevertheless, there is, there's quite a lot of people around us, and so we see this aflatoxin spreading. The other thing that's happening is this picture on the left. This is a very politically sensitive um, issue. It's the Mao forest. It's the forest that put um, Wangari Maathai, who won the Nobel Prize, in prison. She tried to stop the, de the, the destruction of this forest. That would have been an entire green area in about the 60s and 70s, entirely forested with dense tropical rainforest. And it provides the water for the whole of the southern part of Kenya all of the Serengeti and all the way down into the Lake Victoria. But what happened was, after the British left, people started selling the land. And then where the land was sold illegally, people came in and encroached. So the government took a line recently and evicted 160,000 people from this forest. Now those, those people have nowhere to go, literally nowhere to go, so that's, a, that's another issue. But I'm gonna come back to it because what that forest represents and this is the research that we're doing on the ground with, our, with, the, with the warriors in my village, is we're now mapping all of the medicinal trees, all of the ecosystem services, the honey and so on and so forth, the pollinators. And the first estimate is that the Mao Forest is a water tower for Kenya, but its actual value to Kenya alone, not speaking about Tanzania and some of the other countries, but to Kenya alone is worth more than the tourist industry. And remember what I said at the beginning? The tourist industry is more than 10% of GDP. So that's how important natural resources are. And that's why we're trying to put communities back into the forest who understand the forest, the Ogiek tribe and others who will actually live there, maybe do companion planting and so forth. So our vision is very much that we want to recreate some places where communities can genuinely go. We do have real problems about wildlife conflicts, um, made worse by climate because literally animals seem to be going back into the places where they used to go, um, and now there are people there. But for most of the Maasai, this is 
kind of it goes with the territory. And so in pretty much every place, they, you can go to a community and they'll say, yep, dangerous animals have attacked our community, they've killed somebody, they've eaten our livestock, and so forth. So it's just a continuous thing. The answer from the development world and from, I would say, many who come in from conservation is try to separate. And this is complete, uh, it is completely misunderstood by the Maasai because they say, no, but we've always lived with wildlife and we can be quite smart. You know, if an elephant comes after us, we know how to run to avoid the sound waves. If the buffaloes are coming, we know what to do. If the lions are coming, we know what to do. Um, so they find this kind of conservation really strange where they're not allowed to put fences up, but on the other hand, they're sort of wanting people to stay away from the wildlife, and yet Maasai have literally co... They've basically grown up with them all the time. So we have some very, very difficult, what I would call, projects and conservation projects and development projects on the ground, which go counter to everything. So I will leave that with you, sort of that's the African bit, and now we're going to jump to the north, and we're going to do twinning, because this is... In a way, I've seen this as a little bit like our substitute for communities. So you've kind of lost contact with your tribe. So what you're looking for is somebody who you feel comfortable with. And so we came up with, in Europe, twinning. So we have town twinning, and I'm sure you, you enjoy it here as well. So in, in, in Europe, it's been around for quite a long time, about a thousand years, but it really got going at the beginning of the, of the 19th, 20th century. And so we had you know, different, different sort of towns finding each other. Maybe somebody visited and they liked it, or they liked the cheese, I don't know, they liked the wine, they liked something. Or maybe the mayor just fancied the trip to France every year. There was a lot of things like that going on. So anyway, lots of things happening. But after the Second World War, it really was about peace building. So this was the idea that we would twin many, many towns who previously may even have been at war with each other, and this would be a way to essentially create peace amongst us. Um, it got a huge burst of uh, sort of enthusiasm, I would say, when the European Union really took it on board, and so we're actually going to sponsor and we're going to support it. Uh, and then by about the, two, the beginning of this century, um, it, it really became something that was about business links. But some really odd ones have happened. I, th I just love the one on the top. Welcome to dull, paired with boring in Oregon. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, much more sinister, I have to say, is the one below, which is a town where these are the twins from the twins that were the experiments during the war. It's very, very it's, it's slightly weird, but anyway, that's 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 a, so. There's all kinds of reasons why twinning happened, um, and so I started to look at what what brings communities together. Because in my case, in the Maasai, it's very obvious. You're an extended community, so it's not really twinning. It's about making sure that that community is sort of talking to each other, and there'll be villages here and villages there. But essentially, you're all kind of from the same from the same piece, even if you're in Tanzania or Samburu or wherever. But in Europe and in other parts of the world, there is a genuine feeling that you want, to be, you want to be interacting with a community that's like yours. And so you can see that there's all these sorts of vernacular words that are used, sister cities, partner towns, fraternization, friend cities, and so forth. So there is a deep-rooted need, I believe, anyway, in the human condition to reach out to like-minded groups of people but in a sense, in our modern world, it's, it's very different. It's not like you're going to have uh, necessarily blood relations with them. And so when we interview communities or towns that have twinned and ask them, why do you do it? You know, what is it? What, what's the thing that you're looking for? It's quite, in, it's quite interesting. So in, in Africa, you see that here you've got sort of things that have to do with um, seasons and climate, and it, it's kind of their, their communities that are suffering in a way from many, many similarities. Here in America, this is the wordle from a lot of towns that are twinned in America. Very strong language. Um, hate, school, I mean, just, just a whole different way of doing it. In the UK, there's a new, a new movement to sort of twin towns which have to do with um, prosperity. So there's, there's a kind of drive now to analyze, well, why do, why do communities get together? Why do, twin, why do towns twin and so forth? So I asked the question, 
Is this a mechanism? Is this something that the world needs to do? Is it just something that's superfluous? Or is it really a kind of measure of some deep, deep-rooted requirement um, amongst groups of people to, to reach out? And then I started to think about how do you achieve sustainability and prosperity? And the very first thing you learn is that sustainability is not just about your little self, it's about your connection into the whole. So then that by, def by default things makes you think that you're going to be connecting to others. Now there's been a lot of thought on this. Many people, many famous writers have written, in fact, about this. This need to connect, this need to create communities of like-minded people. Um, and it has to do with health and economics, um, the spirit level, a very, very good book around why um, inequality is so uh, pernicious and why it drives communities apart. So there's an enormous literature about this. So we, we and, and a whole group of us started to think about, well, what makes sustainability and why is it different from well-being and prosperity? Because in fact, it turns out that it is very different. So I started to sort of deconstruct what, what is it that makes prosperity. So you can often hear people talking about nature as part of prosperity. And what do we mean by that? Well, we, we genuinely mean that to do well, to prosper, to have a good sense of life, you need to have good functioning, well-functioning ecosystems, clean water, clean air, and so forth. Not feeling that you're going to be living in a polluted world. Then there's a whole discussion around this intensity of connectedness. So I made it very clear, you know, in a tribe like this, it's very clear that everyone's kind of on the same page. They understand who everybody is. There's a deep and long, long history of that connection. But in the modern world, we are creating other kinds of connections. Some might be ephemeral. They may actually come and go. They may be through social media. But even in social media, you have these rooms which essentially echo chambers where people are talking to themselves about the same thing. And so the question is, is that a real community? Does that represent a community? And so the question you would ask is, well, to what degree is, that a con is it a connected group of people, other than just you know, electrons connecting them? And what's the intensity of this, this connectedness? And we can study that. The next thing that you can look at is also the dependency. How do people not only depend on each other, but what is their dependency on nature and the natural world? So it tells us about how society can organize itself around resources. Um, and that might be, it may be wealth, but very rarely is it. It's usually about land and food and so forth. So there's an issue in prosperity and sustainability about that dependency. And then, of course, of course, economics comes into this. It's about distributional policies. So when you talk about sustaining communities, one of the hallmarks is that people understand very much what the distributional policy is. So in some of the older communities, it was very clear there was a hierarchy, there were more wealthy people and so forth, but the mechanism whereby wealth was distributed was actually very apparent and very clear. And one of the challenges we have today, of course, is that it's not clear how wealth is distributed and how resources are distributed. This is one of the hidden factors. And so going forward, if you want to have a transparent world, you will have to actually expose what these distributional policies really look like. And maybe they're not a policy. It's probably just something you wouldn't want to even write down. And then finally, um, the more you look into what makes communities tick, you find that some communities particularly have really brought out this idea of a kind of naturalist intelligence. In other words, truly understanding amongst the different kinds of intelligences that Howard Gardner spoke about, that there is really a deep-rooted form of multiple intelligences. And some of the communities that are beginning to link into each other are those that have multiple roots of intelligence in common. They think about things in the same way, even though they may come from very different cultures. So this is really the point. You can have communities that are drawn from different cultures because there's something else about being a community when you think of the intelligence systems, when you think about the dependencies, and when you think about what drives communities forward. So if we think about sustainable development, the first thing you realize is you can't do it alone. You have to do it in groups of people. You have to do it, in a sense, as communities and societies. So this nice shiny thing that we talk about and we work towards and we measure and we, we have targets and we have progress towards it and countries go to the UN and they report on their latest progress, even though it's all voluntary. 
um, they all want to do well. It, it's, in a way, it's partly a miasma because when I say to, I mean, I used to meet a lot of ministers and people like that, I used to say, okay, so why are we doing this? You know, what's it all about? 17 goals. Um, what happens if you achieve three of them? What happens about all the other ones, you see? And so it's very easy to get sucked into, I'm going to really focus on, let's say, zero hunger. I'm going to put all our efforts into that. I mean, Kenya has a, the big four agenda. It's food, health, housing, manufacturing. There's a whole bunch of other things you have to do to be able to deliver that. So the sustainable goals need, in a way, a raison d'etre. It's not enough to say sustainable development. Well, what is the answer? I'll just give you an answer. It's certainly sitting there at the back end in number 17, um, which is going beyond GDP. And I'm, I'm sure many of you have read books and magazine articles and something about going beyond GDP, because GDP is not a good measure of the good life. It is not a good measure of sustainability and prosperity. Um, uh, many people have said that. So then the challenge comes, and this is what member states struggled over and never came to an answer. Well, what other measures exist? So there's inclusive wealth, there's a social progress one, the one I've put up here, and so forth. But none of them really were able to create this holistic picture of what it takes to really, in a sense, deliver prosperity, which is the outcome of achieving, in a sense, all those different goals within sustainable development. So the calculus of prosperity is quite a tricky thing to do because it's not like putting together the GDP numeraire. That's a bunch of accounts. It's an input-output set of tables. You're almost entirely talking with one currency. But actually, what we're talking about is a whole bunch of things that are all going to be measured in different ways. They're not all going to be measured by one simple metric. So you might have, for example, a whole calculus around how the planet is operating. Um, you know, are we near to thresholds? Are we, are we getting perilously close to change? you might have to have a whole conversation about consumption and production. And you certainly will need to have a conversation about distributional fairness and equity. So all of these are kind of measured in different ways. So I, together with colleagues around the world, have started to roll out something called PROCOL, Prosperity Co-Laboratories, because we realize that you cannot do any of this work from an academic perspective. You have to work with people with communities, and you have to co-produce that knowledge to find out essentially what's going to make people tick, what's going to make people change behaviors, because we're going to ask people potentially in the future to do a lot of things that they're not doing today or to stop doing some things they're doing today. So we're working in uh, places like El Geo Marraquet, a very, very rural agricultural uh, part of the world, a lot of sustainable cities, um, London, East London, Beirut, you name it. So many, many places all over the world. And what we do is we bring together communities over successive weekends and successive days, and we ask them, what is the good life? What, what do you understand to be the good life? So if I was to just pick out somebody from the audience, like the president, <laughs> and ask you, what is the good life? What would you say for you, for your family, let's say? I'll put him on the spot now. Okay, to be able to do good things. So, what would you say is the good life? What, what, does, what does prosperity mean to you? What does the good life mean to you? To be able to feed my family, have my kids go to university, to live in a safe community, to have good jobs, to have the ability to retire. And, um, Wonderful. Work with my family and right. my parents. Wonderful. Interestingly, nowhere through that list did you mention money. Of course it's behind there. But... Again and again and again, when we have these discussions amongst communities and we really say to them, what is it? They, they come up with a list almost entirely like the one you have just listed. So essentially, you then have a dilemma, which is there are different words in different languages to describe prosperity, to describe the good life. Um, I'm sure if I asked Mariam, what is it in Farsi, I bet you would find a different word than the one we have here. So in a sense, every language has encapsulated what it is. In Danish, it's hula, 
Um, there, there's all different words. And what it means is tangibly something a little different. So if I describe what it means to be a community that has prosperity in Danish, hula is this sense of, I come home from work in the middle of the winter, there are candles in the house, it feels cozy, and my family is there, and I probably have a meal with them. And, but at the same time, I know that in the summer, there'll be long days of sunshine, and I'll be on the beach, and I'll be riding my bicycle, and, that. and it's that all-encompassing picture. That's what it actually is. So I suspect that each one of you has, a, has something in your mind about what prosperity and what the good life is all about. So we do a lot of this kind of co-production of knowledge to find out in more precise terms, not just sort of vague terms, what really does constitute that. So it's not really to fill the world with more indicators, but it's really to get to that seductive sort of sweet spot where you're realizing that this is the nub of what will make this community actually tick. And this is the bit you need to protect, and this is the bit that's going to connect that community to another part of the world, if need be. So this is the one, for example, that came out of Maishabora, where we were talking to teams and groups and communities in Tanzania and in Dar es Salaam. Um, so these, these are kind of some of the key words. When I did it in Nairobi, I had a huge, huge, big word in the middle, which was the power of voice, wanting to be heard, wanting, needing a space to be heard. So even when people have been exposed to severe conditions, adversity, it is those features that keep hope alive. If you ever go to a refugee camp, and God forbid you would have to spend any time in one, um, hope is what keep many, many communities alive and going. And again, when you interview people in refugee camps, they have a sense of what prosperity is, of what the good life is, and again, Few of them ever talk about money. They talk about safety, they talk about enough food to feed their families and schools and so on. So I want publicly to say that it does not make any sense to have a conversation about a dollar a day being the threshold above which you're not poor. It's a complete nonsense. What it really is, is the people who've lost hope are the poorest. The people who might have no money could actually, as in my case, be in, in the Maasai, be very happy. They don't consider themselves to be poor. In fact, they consider themselves to be very rich because of the world in which they live. So we've developed a prosperity, let's call it a flower, a series of petals, um, where we systematically work through these different areas. Culture and community, the natural prosperity, of course, the foundations, you know, a, a decent job, access to transport and housing, um, healthy people, healthy planet, that means you get access to healthcare in affordable ways. Interestingly, what's missing from the SDGs, no one ever talks about opportunities and aspirations. People have that, but it's not captured in the SDGs. No, it's not in there. There's nowhere that says, we will meet your aspirations or we understand that we need to give you opportunities to have dreams and visions of what you want to do. And that's what a lot of people want. So in the dry language of the SDGs, access to water doesn't cut it. You know, it just doesn't. So we can elaborate what that might look like, but it doesn't really create the setting where people want to come together and just dream together and create things together. So this is a continuous thing, particularly amongst young people. And then, of course, the power of voice and influence. So you'll see some of the things that get identified in the workshops that we run. Um, local value creation, really important. If I'm going to make something, I need to be able to sell it. I need to be able to have a, have a way in which I can create value. Um, and obviously, the, the, the usual things in natural prosperity. But openness and transparency, these are all very, very important in building communities and sustainability. So what I'm proposing, I guess, today is that when you're talking about building sustainable communities, which is a phrase that rolls off people's tongues, particularly in the UN, they're always talking about it, um, I'm saying, yeah, but actually, what, you know, first of all, what is a sustainable community? It's not just a bunch of people who stay together. No, 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 of course it's not. It's much more than that. But what I see happening around the world is that new kinds of created, new kind of communities are being created, and we need to make spaces for those and understand them much better. There are huge drivers of change that are creating these communities. 
So, you know, there's population growth, there's, there's urbanization, changes in, in, electric, in energy and economic development, and of course, climate change and so on. So these drivers in, in, in the back of your mind, just keep them there. Um, what we see, and these are some examples of some new kinds of agriculture, uh, new kinds of uh, communities. So the one on the left, um, totally different, one in a small island in the middle of the Pacific, another one in the Caribbean. Uh, but they found each other because the communities themselves were being poisoned from a long, long, long time of being uh, exposed to and using pesticides. And because they were on islands, they were getting closer and closer to the groundwater being contaminated to the point where they really had to do something quite different. And essentially, the gentleman on the bottom found a way from a traditional uh, discussion that had been um, with, with some of the elders about how they had made waterways that were away from where the actual farming and the, and the practices were done. So he sort of reinstated them. And for one reason or another, he was put in touch by the gentleman is at the top, uh, who's in the middle of the Pacific, and they had exactly the same problem. But more than that, it turns out that their, their kind of um, community structure was very, very similar insofar as it's quite matri matri um, matriarchal. Uh, they had different kinds of ceremonies and so on. So they have essentially created this community to community. So it's not individual to individual. It's not just about the climate smart agriculture because that's what they switched to. But they have now created an inter-island community and they really are building a completely different kind of dialogue between them. No Nobody else has been the interlocutor. No aid agency, no development agency, no government. This is literally community talking to the community. And they found a way to communicate in different languages, and they're doing very well. And what they have derived out of it is a sense of security, that there's another community just like us on the other side of the world. And now we need to do a lot more to tell all the other people around us that this is something that we can participate in. The one on the right is another kind of odd combination, but which is now spreading, which is about seed sovereignty. So on the top is a gentleman. He's one of the uh, organicos. So I don't know if you've been to Havana. All of the food is organic. There are 4,000 small organic farmers who feed that city pretty much every day. Um, and what they have done over the years is actually retain seeds that are able to withstand all different kinds of climate conditions. So we call it seed sovereignty. And here, um, are a group of women who look after a sacred forest and every Wednesday they go into the forest and they harvest food and they give up prayers to, the, to their God. Now it turns out that these ladies in Benin and this community in Havana actually do have a connection because of the slave trade. They actually were connected and they discovered this, but they, did, they didn't discover it straight away. They found it by accident after they'd been talking for quite some time about seed sovereignty and their passion for protecting plants and for actually making sure that the biodiversity was preserved. So they have real cultural links as well as creating this bigger community to try to retain seeds and not have commercial companies come and take over the seed, the seed banks that they've retained. And the group in the middle is actually my community at the bottom, working with solar. The village I have uh, a house near in the UK, Harbury, and a town up in Finland. And that's really sort of where this story starts to wind up. So a very, very kind of modern thinking town in Finland, realizing with a couple of small universities, 60,000 people in the town, 100,000 or so beyond it, realizing that their future looked pretty bleak. They were feeling more and more that they were sort of outside of the ambit of the capital. Um, Nokia was not, you know, all these things weren't really happening and they were gonna be left behind. And, you know, a bit like here, a lot of e-learning, people really at distance, not being able to make it into the center and so forth. So they brought the community together. They got everybody together. And they said, we have to make, we have to do something. Otherwise our community is not gonna survive. So they decided that after a series of meetings and discussions, they decided they wanted to take on a global challenge. They were gonna take on a global challenge, this little town in Finland. So they looked around and they looked at all the people in the community and they said, okay, what could we do? And they decided they wanted to invent a new battery. 
they'd read about lithium problem, and they knew somehow that there were people all over the world sort of not doing too well with batteries. Right, so we're going we're gonna to solve the battery problem. All right, so this is no mean feat, small town in Finland. Anyway, they started, and then eventually they found that they were bringing people in. So it wasn't the university now. This was the community doing it. So they found a guy who knew a bit about this, and there was somebody over there, and then they would talk and that. So effectively, this community has invented a new battery. Now, we, I can't say anything about it because I haven't announced it yet, but it's very, very, very exciting. It's likely to succeed. So I heard about it, and I thought, well, that would really solve my problem because I have a lot of problem with batteries out in the bush. So I called them up and I said, could I be one of your pilot sites? Because I've now got a whole tribe of people who know all about batteries. They don't know much about other kinds of technologies, but they know all about batteries. And we really, really need to solve this. And they said, well, this would be really great because this is a hot place and we're not a very hot place, we're a very cold place, so we'll do that. And then my little village in, in the UK, Harbury, is a village that very bravely decided to go off-grid you know, they'd had it with the government, fed up with all of that, right, we're going off-grid. So we went off-grid. And we have a lovely, you know, community hall and everything else. So this is a... So we have three communities. And what we're talking about is that sense of independence. So that's actually what has driven us together. The batteries are a mechanism. But it's the sense of independence that the community itself is going to start to really function as a cohesive whole of all age groups working together towards some kind of common issue and common problem. The net result is that we're building that community hall in my village, so it's kind of slightly weird, but anyway, that's, that's what it's doing. So there have been all kinds of wonderful discussions, and what we have found is that in communities, knowledge is not in short supply, genuinely, but it's hidden in different ways. And so what we're describing quite often when we have workshops and we're talking about building sustainable communities is that we give people permission to do and be different kinds of people. So, for example, you can be an expert. Great, fantastic. But you can't be an expert in everything. So maybe you might want to be the knowledge exchange person, i.e. you call the meeting and you have the tea people and the coffee and everything else and you host the meeting and you broker the exchange of knowledge. But you might also want to be the exemplification site or, or a reporter, someone who goes and finds out and brings back to the community exactly what is known. So this all makes perfect sense, but it is very liberating because when you're trying to create uh, a sense of what the community is about, people don't always want to be put in the box that they've been labelled for the last you know, 10, 20, 30 years. But they have skills and they do lifelong learning, and they want to change. So what you do is you offer people this ability to evolve and to take others with them. And it's extremely important in the co-production of knowledge that all of those voices get to be heard. And so I go back to the way that language is done and conversations are held in the Maasai, which is that people do not interrupt each other, which is a habit that we have in the West. We jump in and we interrupt and we do all of that. And we see that as encouraging and thinking it's a positive thing because you're trying to help the conversation, there you sit back and you just simply say, eh, eh, and you allow people to speak, and then you come back. So, yeah, conversations are going to be quite long, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but it's a, it's a completely different way in which knowledge is shared and knowledge is given, and that's what makes strong, sustainable communities, is the knowledge that you can bring an idea, you can bring knowledge together and create something really quite spectacular. So we have lots and lots and lots of great ideas in the environment field that will be necessary in the future. I often you know, put some of them out when I'm having community meetings. You know, have you heard about this? Do you know about that? And sometimes they just pick them up and, and then off they go and we put people into contact with each other. So for example, um, here this lady in, uh, there's a whole team in, in Uganda looking at sort of ways to buy a fertilizer. And now, it, it's, in, in one sense, it was driven by a technology, but there's been a cascade of different kinds of approaches. And what it's done is it has totally changed the way in which waste is now dealt with in a whole round of communities in this particular area. And similarly, you know, when you think about the value addition for this lady, when she's been growing her aloe vera and then running the solar. So this setup has become economically very valuable, that's what drove it. But when you go and interview them, they talk about the way that the community has come together. 
So they found somebody who was skilled in solar, someone who was skilled in extracting med medicine, someone who was skilled in doing many different things. And this is what the future is about. It's about creating new opportunities to build sustainability, to build prosperity in a community way, but never on your own. And so in my own village, we have basically said, well, what we're good at is medicinal plants, and we can do tourism, but actually what people are really good at is understanding what the natural world delivers up in terms of medicines. So on a regular day, these guys, and now myself, can identify 253 medicinal plants and know how it can be used in all its forms, leaves, branches, roots, uh, bark. And the other thing is that you never make medicine for yourself. You actually always have to have someone make the medicine for you. That's part of, the, that's part of it. So I have now warriors out in the Mao forest, the one that I told you was very politically sensitive, with the Kalenjin, with the Pocot, who traditionally they would have been killing, well, no, not the Pocot kill people, but anyway, they fight each other quite a lot. Um, and, but they all laid their weapons down, and we agreed that we would map the forest to find its true value. And as I mentioned to you, it now would appear from a very, very sort of thorough survey that's been done, that that forest is worth more than the tourist industry. We have in the forest a plant called an insulin plant. Weird name, but everyone just takes a leaf of it, and there's no diabetes where people take this plant. So uh, we work with you know, people like Wrigley's and others, and maybe there'll be an insulin, a diabetes chewing gum for you soon, that you'll be able to chew gum instead of sticking a needle in you. But there's so much there, it's extraordinary. <coughs> So we see that there is another layer of community building around these medicines and around medicinal plants. So that's one community. And here you bring the elders in. So now you need the elders with all of their knowledge together with scientists like myself. So I can see trees and plants that are very similar from their biochemistry. And the warriors see trees and plants that are similar because they know that they've been using them for particular treatments all those years. We want to create communities at distance. And we want to create a community which understands the natural world. So in that way, we know that there are people who are passionate. They come on safaris. Some of them come to shoot animals as well, trophy hunting. Um, they pay a lot of money to come on trophy hunting in Africa, $100,000 a pop. Um, so we asked them, would you pay $100,000 to come and not kill? but to come and help us actually put chip and pin technology into wild animals so we can map diseases or you know, just basically participate in a tracking, but not necessarily a killing. And we very fortunately have now got some of these trophy hunters who are helping to put collars on animals and put darts in so that we can go and sample and so forth. But what we're offering them when they go home is that they retain that sense of being part of our community and we create like a VR suite. So they're sitting in their room in California, let's say, in their trophy room, where they've helped us to, let's say, uh, tag or to take some samples from a rhino or an animal like that. So it's quite dangerous. I mean, they use bows and arrows. They don't use guns. And they're sitting in this trophy room. And what we're trying to build for them as a sort of gift from the community so they remain connected is a whole virtual reality world where they can relax at night, they can listen to the bush in real time. They can see the animals that they were actually interacting with because they have the tracking. And if they really need to have a trophy on the wall, they can have a 3D printed head of the animal made from the waste in the, in the waste from, from uh, where we live in Sekanani. So we, may, we actually produce the thread to do 3D printing. So we give them a head to take to put on their wall. So they get something there. Um, and I think that's really what the future is all about. So my challenge to you here in Waterloo is you have a fantastic place. I love it. I absolutely love this place. So you've got great university, great community. I mean, really, why not ask what is prosperity here in Waterloo? And perhaps that's something that you might take away. And these are some of the things you could, you could think about, a deep transformation of Waterloo. Where, where are you going? What does it really look like? You, you already do data literacy and open government, but you know, there's still so much more that you can do as a community. Um, how do you build trust so that you have young and old and a whole group of people who really share in the conversation and that you're not really separate, you're really are, you really are a community? Um, 
and then you know, moving away from the status quo to a more prosperous future. So we've made games, which uh, I'm leaving here. Mariam's got some of the games. We're playing the games with the, the schools tomorrow, and today we had, a, we had a course. So lots of collaborative games, card games, and so on, so you can learn how to do that. So I'll leave you with this one thing. A single bracelet doesn't jingle. You can't do it on your own. You want to go somewhere quickly, go on your own. But if you really want to achieve something, go with a lot of people. So I leave you with that. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I just want to, on behalf of all of you, thank uh, Dr. Jacqueline McGlade for an interesting talk. You've taken us far away to a place that many of us probably have dreamed of going, and now we will not go to those bush huts that um, are not doing the right kind of development, but, um, but we'll let ourselves dream about visiting Jackie in another way. But you've taken us elsewhere, but you've also reminded us that, you know, we all the time, and at least me, I talk about sustainability, and I talk about prosperity. We talk about that even in our strategic plan. And you've, you've reminded us that sustainability and prosperity involve community, it involves nature, it involves adventure, it involves being together, and it involves hope. And uh, this is a wonderful gift that you've given us. So thank you very much. We're going to go sit down and uh, we're going to take a few questions from the audience and uh, and I, I, I think, do you want to take two or three at a time so that you can bundle yes. them? Yeah, okay, so that's what we'll do. We'll go sit down and then I'll, I'll point to two or three people, we'll assemble the questions and then Jackie will uh, try to, to frame answers that, that address the set. Okay, okay. great. Thank you. Want some water? Okay, let's take one from the top. Do we have a, a hand up there? Okay, we'll take one down here then, the back. Um, do we have something at the front too? Because we want two or three questions. We've got a person here. What's coming back to you, yep. How many do we have here? Just one down, and then maybe over here. Have you got a mic too? Maybe pass it in. We'll take first you and then here, we're, then we're going to go right, right to the back. Yeah, right to the back, and then over here to the red, to the bright jacket. Okay. There's nobody waving. You're waving from the top. Okay, good. You'll get. You'll be number three then on this round. I think there's a microphone coming to you too. Do you have a mic over there? No. Okay. You'll have to shout. Okay. Excellent. All right. Please from the back. Okay. Um. There's um. um oh. Wow. That was loud. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, you know, years ago I read that there was the optimum size for a business is 150 people because um, you know everyone by name. Have you found that there is an optimum um, people, number of people in a community to, to really function as well as it should? Okay, and over here. Uh, do I ask my question? Yeah, we'll just uh, assemble two yeah. or three questions, yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McLeod. Um <coughs> My question is around, so... I recently took a course from uh, Ontario College of London um, around the topics around climate change risk and uh, sustainability. One of the things I found ten very tangible to this kind of topic was uh, they started c creating these values of natural resources. You talk about how the forest is 10% you know, of the GDP and how it's worth more than the tourism industry. So I want to ask your opinion on if you believe building these new financial assets around the valuing natural resources and the coming changes, whether that will lower a country's value or above it, these financial assets will actually, by putting the dollar value on something like this, would it actually help uh, sustaining this uh, or actually damage it because we are just turning into, again, dollars? Okay, these are two very different questions, so maybe I'm going to let you answer those and then we'll come up to the top. Okay. So on the size of communities, it really depends where you live. Um, I worked for a long time in Greenland, and there, there it's a, a thousand strong community, and they sort of need each other because through the winters and so on and so forth, everybody is really doing something that keeps that community intact and together. Um, where I am, you, th it's very clear that villages often function at the level of 100, 150, exactly as you've said, um, but we can withstand a lot more 
that there, there's, it's always resource limited. That's the point. So it's a little bit different from a business. I think when you're talking about the living community as opposed to the size of business. But I strongly agree with you that um, units of about 150 actually operate very well in this world. Um, and organizations that don't think of that very carefully and grow quickly lose sight of what, how many numbers of interactions you need to make things go quite smoothly. And Ford um, company, Ford car company, the young, the young Ford who took over forgot that and tried to take small elite groups forward with him, with all of his new ideas, leaving behind an enormous group of people who literally lost sight of, of the groups ahead of them. And they just, uh, they, it sort of broke down. And somebody analyzed those, those failures and they said that there was a, there was a loss of cohesion amongst the smaller, uh, that you need to have for these smaller units. So it's a very, very good point to, to keep, keep in mind. On the, um, how can I put it? A lot of people in Latin America absolutely abhor the word natural capital. And we were talking about this the other day. So it's kind of one of those words lost in translation. So here in America, certainly in Europe, there's a lot of discussion around natural capital, social capital, um, human capital, and so on. And that word capital sticks in the throat of many, many people who literally live on the basis of the natural world. Um, I tend not to use it. I must admit, I'm very careful. And I don't believe in commoditizing, of course, or, or necessarily putting a dollar value or a currency value on all parts of nature. The case in point, though, for the forests is very interesting because the competing other that would take over that space is timber or farming, which has real market value. So what you're trying to establish is an alternative. And by chance or, or by careful design, it is possible to see how the medicines themselves, even if they became global goods, would generate, there's enough in that forest to generate global sources for at least two to three cancer drugs, one antibiotic, certainly an antiseptic, an insecticide, and possibly um, something for diabetes. So you're talking about a resource that you definitely could put a dollar value on, and you might want to because you might want to protect it. So I think it really depends, but I try not to put that commodification at the front of why you want to value um, ecosystems and the natural world. Okay, now I'm going up, and I think you, you said you'll shout for us, right? I'm fascinated that you married a Maasai chief, and I'd just like to know that story. Oh. Oh. Later. And I, oh, no, okay, uh, you know, you, you needed to be around this weekend. We, uh, you know, we invited Jackie over to my home, and we were making Christmas cake all day, and so we heard the story, but... Uh, Actually, it's partly li it is partly available, because I did um, a life scientific for the BBC on the radio, Radio 4, and I don't know how he managed, but Jim Akaleli, who's a wonderful interviewer, managed to get it out of me. So um, it was a story of by mistake, but anyway, or by accident. It was an accidental marriage, so, uh, but it's wonderful. I'm, <laughs> I'm totally in love with my husband. Don't, 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 uh, don't doubt that at all. <laughs> all right, a few more questions here. We've got one here, and then we'll take one on the other side, if there is one right here, if, if uh, we have a second microphone. Okay, please. Thank you for this talk and the inspiration. Do you find that best gets in the way of better? Yes, absolutely. And when you live in a mud hut, there is no best. There's always bits falling off it. Um, and it's all about mud management. And the cows just don't produce enough cow dung when there's a drought. So it's all about compromise. I realize that with my house. So that, you know, you c I, I completely agree. I mean, I'm using that as a sort of silly example, but yes. Yes, and I've always, in my own life, I've always said, try for the best, but if you get 80%, brilliant, because it's 80% better than it would have been if you hadn't started. So yes, it's my, it's my mantra, my motto, but yeah. Okay, good, we have a microphone here. Hi, um, I'm an environmental student, and um, I find that a lot of environmental students um, struggle with like despair or um, like burnout about like dealing with environmental issues and I was wondering because you have such a like breadth of environmental um, 
the experience. War, the war wounds are all here, by the way. <laughs> you know, the bruises and everything. <laughs> so I was just wondering how you deal with burnout or if you've ever experienced that. Yeah, I mean, okay, so this is, a, this is kind of like a life story, but it is very important because a lot of young people, and, and actually little, little ones, sit in meetings or, or presentations, and I was in a big science festival recently, and there was an audience entirely of kids of about six to, six to 11, and they were asking desperately sad questions like, you know, we understand that biodiversity means that, you know, all these animals are going to die. Is it true? Um, are we going to be able to live on the planet in 100 years? You know, it was, I was almost in tears listening to all these questions. What I said to them was, um, it's probably not as bad as you're thinking. But more importantly, you can do something about it. And yes, you can do things like deal with, deal with plastics in your life and so on. But you know the best thing? Get a buddy and then get another buddy and get a whole group of you and actually start talking about positive things and solutions that you can find. Because having friends in life is probably the best thing you can do if you're, if you're, if you're feeling that it's just too much. And I, and I, I really mean that. I, I genuinely mean that. I think a lot of young people isolate themselves around the preoccupation of it's all going to hell in a handbasket. And it isn't. And there's so much that can be done. But it won't happen on its own. So you need guys to help you. You need friends to help you. And as I said, there's, there's no sense in doing things on your own. So find, find a group of people and do it together. Make it fun and make it last. I wonder if I could ask a question. I wonder if you, you could share maybe one of the more interesting challenges you had while you were working for the United Nations Environment Program. I know you had exposure to so many issues and you were sort of at the epicenter and all kinds of things. I wonder just for the group but whether there's any, any particular event or issue or, mm -hmm. or story that, that, that you, you'd like to share. I mean, there are many kind of skirmishes. But I, I would say probably one of the, one of the interesting situations. Um, if you're a senior person in the UN, you're careful that you don't try to take over negotiations. But there come moments when the member states are utterly unable to negotiate, where they literally are too far apart and they can barely come into the room. And I found myself in exactly that position around sand and dust storms between Iran, Iraq, Turkey, so a piece of the, piece of the planet that some of you know very well, America and Europe, and then some sort of hangers-on, some interesting countries who were aligning, and I couldn't really understand why. So it was, it was quite an extraordinary experience because the science is really difficult. Sand and dust storms, I mean, they arise primarily from the Sahara Desert, and it's nobody's fault that we have the Sahara Desert. It's kind of just there, and it's like a big basin waiting to go up in the air and move. But each party was convinced that the other side were, was creating sand and dust storms, really, seriously. So I'm afraid the people on this side were accusing the people on this side of pulling up all the trees. And the people on this side were accusing this side of having fountains and water flowing in the daytime just for frivolous reasons. And this is why there was no water in the marshes, and, 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 and. And they found absolutely every reason not to agree. And meanwhile, I, you, none of you, I'm sure, have been in a sandstorm. People are suffocating. You know, you, you can kill 10,000 people in a day from a really bad sandstorm. So what I, said, <laughs> what I sort of had to do with them was to say, actually, this issue of sand and dust storms has to do with everything else in your world. It has to do with nuclear power. It has to do with energy. It has to do with fossil fuels and all of that. So it was like opening up an agony aunt. And, and, and actually, that's what it was all about. And so I had to take them off individually. And, and it became like an existential exercise where people, I said, well, what's really worrying you? And, and it was a bit like, OK, tell me, about your, tell me about your woes and your life. And, well, it turned out that two of them, I mean, this is the funny side of it, two of them were going through a very difficult divorce. So they got together. That was fine. They were chatting away about all the difficulties. You know, like, like really so, together? No, 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 no not okay, really together, but at least understanding <laughs> you know, it was a tough time here. The US negotiator found great solace in talking to, uh, believe it or not, our Iranian colleagues about um, actually how golf wasn't as easy as everybody thought. So they were off talking about something. So within about a day, for, for reasons that had nothing to do with sand and dust storms, 
we actually ended up with a global agreement on sand and dust storms and, and launched a fund of many, many millions of dollars. But it had nothing to do with sand and dust storms, and this was my point. So that was a nice outcome. But it, what it showed me is that the, the role of the, uh, someone in the UN particularly is to create the space for people to talk quite often. It's not to be the negotiator, not to find clever words, although sometimes as a na native speaker you have to do that. But it's actually giving people, again, the opportunity and allowing them to say something that's quite difficult. And diplomats are very, very good at, say, at not saying what they want to say. And they only know, you only know it when you leave the room and, you know, and, the, and the sword is all the way through <laughs> and you realise that was the deadly blow. So they're very, very good at this, but they have their weaknesses. So that was the wonderful thing. And then there were horrible things, which I don't want to share here. Don't want to relive, okay. No. Let's take two more questions. Okay, we've got one here and there. There's three, all right, three. One, two, and three. Okay, we'll wait for the microphones to get back to you. We need a chat box to throw across the room. <laughs> um, so when we're talking about communities, uh, one thing that stuck out to me was that there's a real material need for the bonds that exist. So with the Maasai, the 100 or 150, they need to be there or they won't survive. Or in Greenland with the 1,000 people, there's a real uh, immediacy to the um, bonds that they create, but in countries like Canada, uh, I've noticed that uh, our um, bonds don't feel as real or necessary. Mm -hmm. So how do we translate that and create real communities when it doesn't feel like we need them, especially when we live in a, in a capitalist society that rewards selfish behavior? I'll come back to that. I, I, we should take another one. That's a very yeah, good question. Yeah. Who, who's the other microphone here? We got one, and then we'll come back to you in a minute. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, so in the news a lot lately, um, I know a lot of people have been seeing a lot of resistance to change and new, new technologies and progress that's across Canada, North America, and a lot of the industrialized world. Um, I hear these, you, you've got these great stories of introducing solar panels and batteries and, and new town halls um, in your own community. And I was wondering if you encountered resistance to that kind of change in progress. If so, how you opened up that resistance and if not, why do you think it's different there? Okay, so we've got bonds in, in mm -hmm. Canada and resistance here. Yeah. So let me try to answer it by giving two examples and I think it will answer in fact both. So um, imagine, okay, so there are some technologies that are a bit iffy and out on the edge, right? We're not too sure about them, particularly in the climate change area, but there are other things around. So I would like to kind of draw your attention to Denmark, and, and this came up today in another conversation. So the way that the Danes deal with ethical issues, particularly around technologies, is completely different from many other countries, and it's the extreme case in much of Scandin uh, compared to even Scandinavia. So I worked there for 10 years, so I, I could see this discussion happening again and again. So they have a device which is effectively when, it, and I'll give the actual example. So a young, very, very bright researcher returned from the US and wanted to open a laboratory to look at artificial life. And okay, artificial life is sort of like out on the edge, but it's in your washing powder, by the way. It's in lots of different things. You know, the ingredients are there. So the way the Danes approach it is, not to have an intellectual conversation by the elites or to have some government panel. They run everything from the bottom up. So in libraries and in meeting rooms all over Denmark, they actually discuss. So the first thing that happens is that people go and explain, well, what is artificial life? What's going to happen in the lab? How's this all going to work? You know? What are the repercussions? So there's a whole round of actually explaining what it entails. And just through that very process, people become communities because they actually start to think about it, they think about the ethics, they think about the science and so forth. And then there's another round where they say, okay, now we're going to come together and we're going to find out whether we can find answers. And So it gradually, gradually builds up and then eventually they have two big meetings and they have an ethics panel and they have a, a, a group of people who look at it from the perspective of society but also from finance and so on. And then eventually 
there's a, there's, a, there's a way in which that is transcended up to the cabinet and to the prime minister's office and it's talked to through the ministers. So when the decision is made, it's a no surprises. And in fact, they granted him his grant and he opens the laboratory and things go forward and it's fantastic research. It's truly amazing. Um, but everybody kind of understood it. And I, I take that because there's a huge level of trust. It's almost as if Denmark comes together, six million people as a community, and they tackle the problem together. No one's left out of the conversation at all. And if you don't understand it, you can ask again. I, oh, I didn't quite get that. You know? So I like that. I think that's sort of where we're going with some of these big technologies. You need groups of people large enough to have all the different views and all of the worries. But you're not voting on it per se, but you're reflecting on it. So it's about being reflexive in society. And so I come to the same thing uh, to answer your question about the insular world we live in and the separation that we have and how difficult it is, potentially, when you have, you, where you say selfishness is, re is rewarded. Um, that's pretty easy to turn on its head. If you take the example I've just given you and you think about issues to do with climate change, we used to have something called Local Agenda 21, which was extremely powerful. People used to come together and talk about you know, what we were going to do and that. And those communities still do exist. They're still functioning very, very well. And I believe that the time is right to, to re-instigate and bring people out of their isolated boxes, out of their sort of selfish behavior, I'm, I'm being rather pejorative, but really and truly, and to actually have a vision of what these communities could be. And I think Waterloo is, is absolutely the right size, could easily take on some of these, some, of, some big issues and create communities around it. I think I promised one more hand in the middle here as the final question, and then uh, I think there's one coming on this side probably more quickly. I don't know. There's a race of microphones now. Okay. Uh, pretty soon I'm going to end up getting both microphones now, one I <laughs> figures. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that your comments about, about prosperity not including, not account about money not being included in the definition of prosperity is absolutely brilliant. And I think that it would definitely be a new and innovative way of thinking about how we are, about uh, how we live our lives. But as, as indicated by the comments regarding the, regarding greed being rewarded, there are obviously still people out there, and indeed many groups with a lot of power out there that are, that still believe that the bottom line is is key to prosperity. What I wonder is, would it be, is it possible to potentially sway those people's opinions to focus away from that? Do you believe it's already being done? Do you believe it's already being done? And if not, to what extent do you believe we need to go to in order to make, in order to make that arguments heard and convincible to those specific kinds of people? Okay, well, You'll never get people away, I think, in our society here from the, de the, the desire to, to have wealth. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a deep-rooted driver. But when I stand back and I look in the world today and I see so, so many people out on the streets, so, so many people aggrieved, so many people pushing against what are clearly the exigencies of, um, well, essentially inequality, at, at their extreme, then I, I'm very conscious and I'm I was still in, in a kind of a, in an inner circle of people in the UN who talk about the consequences of what is happening in our world on the ground. So something will have to give, there's no doubt about it. But it won't be the same everywhere and that's the challenge, is there's no simple solution. I'm sure everybody in this room knows that and, and I'd be naive to say that there is a simple solution. Nevertheless, what what is emerging on the streets, for example, in Chile and others, distressing as it is, is a very interesting conversation. Because without government, people look to forms of leadership. They look to other ways of organizing lives. They look to local administrations. They look to so on and so forth. And there is a trend, anyway, across the world to devolve a lot more decision-making down to the local. And it's much harder to hide wealth locally. It's very, very difficult. So if you look at all the island communities, for example, conspicuous wealth is looked down upon in many places. 
because who knows what might happen next month and then you know you have to sell the car that nice car that you just bought last month you know so if you don't want to look like an idiot there tends to be a bit of moderation on that and i think it comes back to the very first question about the sizes of communities that function well and it's the sense that you can keep check on people and that's why in the world today the open government partnership openness and transparency is the most powerful thing that we have going on because when you talk to people on the streets and i was I, I got caught up in in some i got caught up in a few riots in my lifetime but recently i got caught up in a few and it's all about transparency and openness when you say we're going to have mandatory company beneficiary lists which go down to the the one percent so that everybody who's going to benefit from a company is now in a public register Actually, it's very transformative because you see where the wealth is accumulating. And if you look and see the 70 countries that are part of the Open Government Partnership, which was set up to fight corruption, it's an anti-corruption program, it has all of these additional benefits, the sort of roll-on and the roll-out. So whilst I don't think people will ever want to give up money or some form of exchange of currency, um, and reciprocity has, in a sense, the same dynamics, I think openness is what will be the transforming feature. I'm convinced of it. Okay, well on that very hopeful note, and being reminded that our guest has also given us a challenge, um, let's, um, let's think about how we'll rise to the challenge and thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. Thank you.